Hey everyone, my name's Pete Kraus, and in this video, I go step by step through the walkthrough that comes preset in your copy of Oath Chronicles of Empire and Exile. And you can kind of get a good feel of how the game works that way. Now, I will say that I went through this playthrough, I'm actually going back in time, because it was right after I read the rules and opened the game and kind of unboxed it. So hopefully it's not too clunky and you can follow along from there. So with that said, let's let her rip. In the box, you have this handy packet A that I'm gonna open now. These cards provide a card base setup that we're gonna to use to set up the game. Next, we're gonna find the eight sight cards that are located under this top instruction card and place them in the slot shown below. One, two, and three are the plains, mountains, and rocky coast. The rest of the sight cards get placed face down in the order shown. So next, we're gonna put the purple pawn on the plains the red and blue pawns on the mountain, and the yellow pawn on the rocky coast. Next, it says find the 24 purple warbands, and you're going to put two of these on the plains, one on the mountains, and then one on the rocky coast. Put the round marker in the visions drawn marker on the first starred spaces of the round and visions drawn track. Then put three favor tokens in each of the six favor banks near the bottom edge of the board. Then it says, read next card. There's 18 favor tokens, 20 secret tokens, your 10 attack dice, six defense dice, and one end die. Not end dive that you make collard greens out of, end die. These next pieces I'm gonna place near the top of the board. The first one is the Oath Keeper of Supremacy goal reference. Next to that one, I'm going to place the Banner of the People's Favor, and you'll notice this one has two sides. You're going to place the intact banner side up, not the broken banner side, and then you'll put a favor token on top of this card. Next to this one, I'll place the Banner of the Darkest Secret, and then this one gets a secret token. Moving on to the next card. The player playing the Chancellor sits on the short end of the board near the cradle. Now this Chancellor board has two sides, the Chancellor and then the Clockwork Prince side. Only use the Clockwork Prince side if you're playing a one or two player game, or you can use it in multiplayer games if you want an automated Chancellor. Below that, place the Imperial Reliquary board. Place the purple warbands near the Chancellor board, then take three of these and place them right on the board. Next to these warbands, place two favor tokens and one secret token. Put the supply marker on the leftmost space of the supply track, and for the Chancellor, this one's purple, and then cover up the word Chancellor with the Oath Keeper tile. For this scenario, we're playing with the red, blue, and yellow exiles. Make sure the exile side of the board is up, and then put them in this order clockwise from the Chancellor. Start with red, next is blue, and then end with yellow. For each exile, take their warbands and place these next to the player board, then take three warbands and place them directly on the player board. Next to this, they get only one favor token and then one secret token. Then place the supply marker which matches the color of the exile in the leftmost space of the supply track. Next we're going to return the rest of these packet A cards back to the box and then open packet B. Then we pick up the next card, which is called Longbows, and place this next to the planes. Then we take the next three cards in this deck and place them in the Cradle discard pile. So now I'm confused. It says stop, but then it also says flip over, and my curiosity is getting the best of me and I have to flip this card over. Okay, I take it that the stop sign was just to say stop drawing cards for the discard pile, not stop setting up. Take the next card, Taming Charm, and place this face up next to the mountains. And then take the next three cards and place these face down in the discard pile next to provinces. I think I know the drill here. We're going to flip this one over and it's probably going to have us do the same thing for the hinterlands. So this one says take the next card, Elders, and place this face up next to the rocky coast. Then take the next five cards and place them face down in the discard pile for the hinterland. The next four cards are called Advisors, and they go to the right of the Chancellor board and each Exile board. The Chancellor gets the card Forest Paths. The Red Exile gets Animal Playmates. 
the blue exile player gets naysayers, and the yellow exile player gets the card a small favor. Place the remaining cards from packet B on this world deck space face down on the map, and then we open packet C. Then this Grand Scepter Relic card goes next to the Chancellor board. Then the next card, Ivory Eye, goes to the right of the Taming Charm card next to the Mountain space. The next four Relic cards go face down in any order on this Imperial Reliquary. And then put the 15 remaining relic cards face down in this relic deck space. And finally, we're done. Return to the playbook. So the Chancellor takes the first turn of this walkthrough, and we start with the wake phase. Since it's the beginning of the game, there's really not much that happens here. The wake phase is really just to see if anyone meets a winning condition, or maybe you have a card, one of your advisors, or a card that has an ability that activates during this wake phase. Since it's the beginning of the game, not much happens, so we move on to the act phase, and this is where most of the turn takes place. So each player has a supply track at the bottom of their player board, and I think of this almost like a gas tank that gets refilled at the end of your turn. You have so much fuel that you can use on your turn, and once you're out of fuel, you kind of run out of actions. You can take all of these actions on your turn in any order, but you need to have supply to pay for those and some other resources for some of the actions. The first action it says in the walkthrough that the Chancellor takes is the search action. For that, it's going to cost two supplies, so I move the supply tracker to the right two spaces. Now the reason the search action costs two supply for the Chancellor is because this tracker marker is in this first space and it says number two. That means you pay two supply. When this tracker marker moves to space one or two here, then the search action costs three supply. And as you can see here, as it progresses, it'll cost four supply later in the game. This tracker marker progresses every time a vision card is drawn from this deck. As you can see, it's the Visions Drawn Tracker. We're going to look at Vision cards in a little bit, but to take the search action, the Chancellor just draws three cards, and then the walkthrough says out of these three, the Chancellor's going to keep the card called the Garrison and discard the other two. So when you discard cards from the search action, rather than discarding them in the region where your pawn is located, they get discarded to the region to the right of where your pawn's located. So since the Chancellor's Pawn is located in the Cradle region up here, the Chancellor discards its cards to the discard pile of the Provinces region. Likewise, if the Chancellor's Pawn was in this Provinces region, it would discard its cards to the Hinterland region, and if the Chancellor's Pawn was in the Hinterland region, then it would discard back to the Cradle region. Now the card that you take out of the three you draw for the search action, you can either play that in your advisors next to your player board, and by the way you can only have three advisors, or you can play it next to the site where your pawn is located. For this card, during this walkthrough, the Chancellor is going to play this next to the plane site. And there's another example soon to come where the Chancellor decides to play another search card to his advisors. We'll see that in just a second. The number of cards you play at a site is limited by the number as stated in the upper right corner of the site card. In this case, for the planes, you can have three cards at the site. Now when you play a card to a site, you get to collect one favor from the bank which matches the suit of the card you just played. And so that means I get to take one favor, which looks like a coin, from the bank that matches the suit of the card. In this case, this is the order suit and that favor goes on the Chancellor's player mat. Then the Chancellor gets to use the When Played ability stated on the Garrison card, and it says, When played, gain one warband per site you rule, and put one warband from your board on each site you rule. So we need to find out how many sites the Chancellor rules. And remember, to rule a site, you need to have at least one warband on that site. Your pawn doesn't count for ruling. So if we look at the planes, it's ruled because the Chancellor has two warbands there, so it'll get one warband to add to its player board for that. Chancellor has a warband on mountains, so it'll get another warband for that, and then also another one for Rocky Coast, since the Chancellor has a warband there. So we add three warbands to the player board, 
And then if you remember, the garrison card said, then add one more band to each site you rule. So we put one on the plains, one on the mountains, and one on the rocky coast. So the next action for the chancellor is the trade action, according to the walkthrough. And the chancellor's going to trade at the card called the garrison that it just played. And so then you spend one supply. So I'll move this tracker to the right one space. And the trade action lets you trade secrets for favor or favor for secrets. And in this case, the chancellor's going to trade one secret. So it takes one from its player board and places it on the garrison card. And then it gets one favor, kind of like what we saw before, matching the same suit as this card from the bank. And so this is the order favor. So it takes one coin from there and places it on its player board. Now, later in the game, if the chancellor had advisors that also matched the same suit as the garrison, the order suit, it would also get additional favor for each advisor matching that suit. And then next in the walkthrough, the chancellor takes another search action. So we move the tracker marker two spaces to the right on the supply track, and then we draw three cards from the world deck here. And the chancellor decides to keep Aaron Boy and discard the other two cards. And then this time, instead of playing a card next to the site, the chancellor is going to play this Aaron Boy card to its advisors. And this is going to go face up next to its advisor card. Now, with your advisors, you can only have three cards here. So right now, the chancellor has used two of the three spaces. When you play a card to your advisors, you don't get any favor like the chancellor did previously when it played a card to the site. Now, the next action in the walkthrough the chancellor takes is a travel action. And the Chancellor's going to move its pawn one space down in this cradle region. To do that, the costs for travel for this region are listed up here. And this one means that if you travel to another site within this region, it costs one supply. If you travel to a site in the provinces region, then it costs two supply. And if I wanted to go all the way over to the hinterlands region, it would cost four supply. So we move the marker one space to the right, since the Chancellor's just traveling to another site within this region. So we flip over this new site, and that's going to be Lush Coast, and then we move the Chancellor's pawn to that site. Moving on for the Chancellor in the walkthrough, the Chancellor's going to take a minor action and flip over this card in its advisors and play that to Lush Coast. You could play a face down card if it doesn't have any restrictions to a site where your pawn is located. When you play a card to a site, you get to collect favor from the bank with the same suit as this card. And the suit matching the card is the beast suit, so we'll take one favor from that bank and place that on the player board for the Chancellor. So a face down card in your advisors is kind of like a card in your hand that you can play at any time. A face up card in your advisors, it permanently takes up one of the three spots of your advisors. If you add another card, let's say you're at three cards maximum in your advisors and you add a fourth card, you can discard one of the other cards there. And for the last action of the Chancellor's turn, it's going to take another trade action. So we move the supply tracker marker one space to the right and all of its supply is depleted now. And for this trade action, the Chancellor's actually going to take an opposite trade action and trade favor for a secret versus, like last time, a secret for favor. But to trade for a secret, it costs two favor. So we take two favor from the Chancellor's board, and the Chancellor's trading on forest paths, so we place two favor on forest paths. And then we take one secret from the supply and place that on the Chancellor's player board. I think it wanted to do this just so it starts the next turn with a secret. Next, we move on to the rest phase for the Chancellor's turn. And during the rest phase, you'll return favor and secrets that were placed on cards. We'll return these to favor to the bank of the same suit as this card, which is the beast suit. And instead of putting the secret back in the supply, it actually gets placed on the Chancellor's board. Then we count the war bands that are in the supply for the Chancellor, and that determines where the supply marker gets refilled to. The Chancellor has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 war bands in its supply, so we move the tracker marker up to this 11 to 17 spot, and that's how much supply it has for the next turn. So now that the Chancellor's turn is done, we move on to the Red Exile's turn of the walkthrough. For its first action, the Red Exile takes the search action. But this time, instead of searching the world deck, it's going to search the discard pile of the provinces. Yes, you can search discard piles 
for the region that you're located in. And another thing unique about searching a discard pile is the cost for that from your supply is only two and it's always two. It doesn't increase as the visions are drawn from the world deck. And the Red Exile decides to play the card, the Old Oak, to the site it's at, which is the mountains. And it discards the other two to the Hinterlands discard pile. So I slide the relic over and Red Exile plays that card to the mountain site. So now the mountain site is at full capacity. Since this number's two, that means you can only have two cards at this site. So next, the Red Exile collects a favor from this beast suit we see here. As a minor action, the Red Exile flips over its advisor, and this is the Animal Playmates card. And as you can see with this little icon, this is a card that has to be played. If you play it face up, it has to be part of your advisors. For the Red Exile's next action, it takes a trade action. It's going to trade on the card it just played, the Old Oak. So we slide the marker one space to the right, since the trade action costs one supply. And the Red Exile is going to trade for a secret token. So if you remember from the Chancellor's turn, in order to do that, you need to trade two favor for one secret. And the Red Exile is going to trade with the Old Oak. So we place two favor on the Old Oak. And if we didn't have any advisors matching this beast suit, we would only get one secret. But since the Red Exile has an advisor, it just flipped up with a beast suit. Now you know why it did this. It gets an additional secret. So the Red Exile collects two secrets for this trade. Next, the Red Exile takes the search action again. So we slide this marker two spaces to the right. And this time, instead of searching the discard pile for the province's region, the Red Exile is going to search the world deck. But you'll see this next card that the Red Exile draws is a vision card. And anytime you draw a vision card, you stop drawing. And so in this case, the Red Exile just draws these two cards. Whenever you draw a vision card, just like we talked about before, you advance the vision marker one space to the right. So out of these two cards the Red Exile drew, it's going to play the Alchemist to its advisors and discard the vision. Now as a minor action, the Red Exile is going to use the ability on this Alchemist card. To do that, it must pay the cost. So the cost to use the Alchemist here is right here. This symbol means that you put one secret on the card, and this symbol means one secret is burned and goes back to the supply. And then the Red Exile will gain four favor from any favor bank or banks and takes a favor from Nomad, Arcane, Discord, and Order. Next, the Red Exile takes a recover action to recover the banner of the people's favor. This costs one supply, so we move the supply marker one space to the right. This lets the Red Exile recover the banner of the people's favor. And this just gets placed near the player board. Now, the reason that someone would want the Banner of the People's Favor is it can be used in some victory conditions. When you first acquire this banner, you must put more favor on it than what was previously on it. So in this case, there is one favor on this banner. That actually gets discarded back to a favor bank of your choice. In this case, the Red Exile chooses to put it on the Beast favor bank. And since you have to put more supply on this, the Red Exile takes two favor from its player board and places this on the banner. During the wake phase on following turns for the Red Exile, the Red Exile will have to put a favor token on this, or one will get pulled off of this and put in a favor bank, which has the least amount of favor. This banner can't lose its last favor token. If it does, then you're forced to place one on here if you have one. Now there's an advantage on this banner. If you have a lot of favor on it, it makes it harder for another player to recover or take from you in a campaign. That's it for the Red Exile's actions this turn. We move on to the rest phase, and for that, we remove the favor on this old oak card. This goes back to the beast suit bank, since that symbol's up here. And then the secret token on the alchemist advisor just goes back to the Red Exile's player board. Then we count up remaining war bands and move the supply marker accordingly. So since there's nine war bands, this token moves up to nine. But if you notice, there was one supply that went unspent. And so that means we can move this token one more space to the left. Moving on in clockwise order through the walkthrough, we go to the blue exiles turn. The first thing the blue exiles going to do is use the ability on taming charm. You'll see the cost here is one secret. 
So we place the secret from the Blue Exiles player board on Taming Charm. This action says we can either discard a Beast Suit card or a Nomad Suit card at your site to gain two favor from the matching favor bank. So there is a Beast Suit card that we can discard. And the Blue Exile collects a favor from the Beast Bank. Next, we spend three supply to take a search action. And remember, it's three supply now because the Visions Drawn marker is in the three cost section. And then according to the walkthrough, we're going to draw three cards from the world deck and not the discard pile. And if you notice, the third card we're going to draw is a vision card. So that means we advance the vision's drawn marker one space to the right. And then according to the walkthrough, the blue exile is actually going to place this vision face down in its advisor area. Now, maybe later in the game, the blue exile will reveal this. And when it's revealed, it can be played to this revealed visions area where the player can then try to meet the goal on the vision and win the game. But for now, this just stays face down in the advisor area. The other two cards get discarded to the Hinterland discard pile. As a minor action, we're just going to flip up this Advisor, and this is the Naysayers card. And this has a Rest Phase ability. And then as a minor action, we're going to flip up and peek at the Relic card right here and see what it is. And this is the Ivory Eye, and this lets you peek at any face down site, Advisor, or Relic at a site. Now you can peek at any Relic that's face down on a site that you occupy. Next, the Blue Exile takes a Recover action to recover the Relic, Ivory Eye. That costs one supply. On top of spending one supply to take the Recover action, it says we must burn two favor, which that means favor goes from your player board back to the supply to get this relic. And then that goes face up next to your player board. Now a player can hold any number of relics, and the only way another player can take a relic from you is in a campaign against you. For the Blue Exile's next action, it's going to take a travel action and just move to another site within the province's region. That costs two supply. Now, instead of just moving to the site directly below mountains, you can actually move to any of the other sites at this region for that two supply. And in this case, we're going to move two sites down. So the first thing is you reveal the site, and that's Salt Flats. Now, if we look in the upper left corner, when you reveal a site, if you see icons that show resources, these are resources you'll take from the supply when revealed and place them on Salt Flats. So in this case, two favor and a secret. And then, of course, we move our pawn down there, and that's the blue pawn. For the rest phase, we'll return the secret from Taming Charm back to our player board. Then we haven't used any of our reserve warbands, so we have nine of them. But since there's one supply we haven't spent, we'll move this token all the way to the left. Lastly, during the rest phase, the Naysayers card actually has an ability. If any exile is the Oath Keeper or Usurper, take one favor from the Chancellor. Unfortunately, in this case, the Blue Exile doesn't get anything because the Chancellor is still the Oath Keeper. For the Yellow Exile's turn, we're going to start with the Muster action. And this is a new action we haven't seen. This costs one supply. And for this action, you place one favor on an empty card at the site where your pawn's located. And in this case, we're going to place this on Elders next to the Rocky Coast site. And then that allows me to take two Warbands next to my player board and place them on the player board. For a minor action, the Yellow Exile is going to flip up its advisor. And this is the card, A Small Favor. Notice how it's restricted to just being played as an advisor, and it has this chain on top of it. This is a new symbol. And this means that later on in the game, if I were to play more than three advisors, normally you can exchange one or discard one of them. But in this case, this one stays here for the rest of the game. But it has a pretty powerful ability, and it says when played, gain four warbands. So I take four more warbands from next to its player board and place them on the player board. Seems like we're getting ready for something here. For the Yellow Exile's next action, it's going to take an action we haven't seen yet, and this is the campaign action. So this may answer the question of what all the warbands are doing on the player board. This costs two supply. 
So the first thing you have to do with a campaign is choose a defender. And this can be any other player who rules your site or whose pawn is at your site. And in this case, the Chancellor's Warbands rule the site. So the Chancellor is the defender. If there wasn't another player's pieces here, you can still campaign, but you campaign against bandits. And that's something I talk about more in the overview video. The next thing you have to do is declare targets. And you can declare any number of targets, but you have to declare at least one target from your site. Your possible targets are any sites the defender rules, any relics they hold, their pawn in favor, but the pawn has to be at the same site as you. That doesn't apply here. And so the targets in this walkthrough for the Yellow Exile player is going to be the Rocky Coast site and the Mountain site. And the Mountain site applies because this is ruled by the Chancellor with the two warbands there. So next we figure out how many defense dice the Chancellor gets and how many attack dice I get. To do this, we look at our targets, and that's going to be Rocky Coast and Mountains. And then on the target, if you see this little blue die symbol, that means the Chancellor, or the Defender in this case, is going to get a blue die for that target. So we get one here. And then the other target is the Mountains, and you'll see there's another blue die there. So the Chancellor gets two blue dice at this point. And then if the Chancellor has the Oath Keeper title still, it gets another blue die. So the Defender, the Chancellor in this case, gets to roll three blue dice. For the attack dice here, I'll get one attack die for each warband on the Yellow Exile player board, so nine in this case. However, if we look at the mountain location, I subtract one die from my attack pool since that's one of my targets. This symbol right here means whoever rules this gets to either add one attack die to a campaign or subtract one. And of course, the Chancellor would want to subtract one here. So I have seven attack dice, and the defender has three defense dice. The defender rolls its dice first, and I'll never be able to recreate the roll in the walkthrough, but just to follow the walkthrough, I'm going to say that I get the same result, and that's a shield and a times two and a times two. So for the defense dice, you're adding up shields. One shield equals one defense, and then the times two multipliers multiply that times two. So in this case, we have one shield, multiply that times two is two, Multiply that by two again is four. So right now, the Chancellor has four defense. The Defender also gets one defense for each warband on each of the targets. So if we look at the mountains, since the Defender has two warbands here, it gets two more defense, so that's six. And then the Chancellor also has two warbands on Rocky Coast for a total of eight defense. And again, for the sake of following the walkthrough, I'll say that the Yellow Exile rolled these attack dice, and these are the results it got. Now the first thing we see are these two skulls at the end. That means that instantly the Yellow Exile removes two of its warbands from its player board. To figure your attack, then you just add up your solid white swords, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Now the hollow swords count as a half of an attack, rounded down. So since there's three of these, it only adds one more attack for these two, and this one you just leave out because you're rounding down. So the Yellow Exile rolls seven attack. In a campaign as the attacker, you have the option to discard a warband for another attack. The Yellow Exile discards two more warbands from its player board and gains two more attack for an attack of nine versus eight defense and wins. Since the Yellow Exile is victorious, it kills half of the Chancellor's warbands at the targets that it's, it chose. So we'll say the ones from the Rocky Coast are killed, and those go back in the Chancellor's Supply. And then the two from the mountains go back to the Chancellor's Player Board. Now if the Yellow Exile didn't win, it would sacrifice half rounded down of its warbands on its player board. But since the Yellow Exile player won, it can take as many warbands from its player board as it wants and put them on sites that it won during the campaign, which is mountains and rocky coast. So it takes one warband and places it on mountains, and then two warbands and places them on rocky coast. There can only be one player that has warbands on sites. The player with warbands on the sites rules those sites. Now since the yellow exile player rules both rocky coast and mountains, and the Chancellor only rules planes, 
The yellow exile player rules the most sites, and that means it gets the Oathkeeper title from the Chancellor's player board. If the Yellow Exile has its Oathkeeper title at the start of its next turn or during the wake phase, it would get to flip this title over and become the Usurper. If it continues to hold the title until the wake phase after that, then the Yellow Exile would win the game. So in rounds 5, 6, and 7, this title in an Exile's hands also prevents the end die rolls. The Yellow Exile then spends 3 supply and takes the search action and searches the world deck. And out of the three cards drawn, decides to play the tense card to its site and collects a favor from the Nomad Favor Bank. And since the Yellow Exile Pawn is in the Hinterland region, it discards the remaining cards to the Cradle region. Now the Yellow Exile player is going to use the card ability on tense here. That's used as a minor action, so you don't have to spend supply to do it. The way you use card actions, kind of like we've seen before, is either your pawn has to be at the site where the card is located, or if you control the site because you have warbands there, you can also use the card even if your pawn is at a different site. So to use the action on the card tense, you place one favor on the card, as noted by this icon, and then spend no supply if you're traveling to a site in your region. So the Yellow Exile player spends a favor and moves to this site, so we reveal it, and we reveal wastes. We place the Yellow Exile player's pawn on the site. This has a when revealed thing that you have to do, and that's place a relic next to this card face down. That's noted by this little R in the corner. So we draw a relic and place it next to the wastes. So it's now the rest phase for the Yellow Exile. So since there's nine more bands, we would normally move the supply marker to this plus nine, but since there was one supply we didn't use, we're going to move it all the way to the left. And then we return the favor from Elders and Tents to the Nomad Bank. And so that ends the round and our walkthrough. So the last thing we do is advance the round marker, and then the Chancellor would take its next turn. So that wraps up the walkthrough. From here, you can go on to a couple more videos. One of them is the Oath Start Here video that covers all the rules for this game in detail. And then there's a second video that follows that one that shows all the details of being a citizen player and then how to transition from your first game into your second game by setting up the archive and writing the chronicle. As soon as those videos are ready, I'll put the link here on this end screen and then I'll put a link down in the description. And I'll see you over in the next video.